Dr. Seuss Video Classics. Did I ever tell you how lucky you are? By Dr. Seuss. Narrated by John Cleese. When I was quite young and quite small for my size, I met an old man in the desert of Dries, and he sang me a song I will never forget. At least, well, I haven't forgotten it yet. He sat in a terribly prickly place, but he sang with a sunny, sweet smile on his face. When you think things are bad, when you feel sour and blue, when you start to get mad, you should do what I do. Just tell yourself, ducky, you're really quite lucky. Some people are much more, oh, ever so much more, oh, muchly much, much more unlucky than you. Be glad you don't work on the Bungle Bung Bridge that they're building across Booba Bay at Bum Ridge. It's a troublesome world. All the people who are in it are troubled with troubles almost every minute. You ought to be thankful, a whole heaping lot, for the places and people you're lucky you're not. Just suppose, for example, you lived in Gazette and got caught in that traffic on Zate Highway 8. <laughs> or suppose, just for instance, you lived in Gazer with your bedroom up here and your bathroom There. Suppose, just suppose, you were poor Herbie Hart, who has taken his thrombimbulator apart. He never will get it together, I'm sure. He never will know if the gick or the gore fits into the scrux or the snucks or the snore. Yes, ducky, you're lucky you're not Herbie Hart, who has taken his thrombimbulator apart. Think they work you too hard? Think of poor Ali Saad. He has to mow grass in his uncle's backyard. And it's quick growing grass. And it grows as he mows it. The faster he mows it, the faster he grows it. And all that his stingy old uncle will pay for his shoving that mower around in that hay is the piffulous pay of two douclas a day. And Ali can't live on such piffulous pay. So, he has to paint flagpoles on Sundays in grooves. How lucky you are you don't live in his shoes. And poor Mr. Bix. Every morning at six, poor Mr. Bix has his boffin to fix. It doesn't seem fair. It just doesn't seem right. But his boffin just seems to go slump every night. It slumps in a heap, sadly needing repair. Bix figures it's due to the local night air. It takes him all day to unslump it, and then the night air comes back and it slumps once again. So don't you feel blue. Don't get down in the dumps. You're lucky you don't have a boffin that slumps. And while we are at it, consider the schlots the crumple-horn, web-footed, green-bearded schlots, whose tail is entailed with unsolvable knots. If he isn't muchly more worse off than you, I'll eat my umbrella, that's just what I'll do. And you're lucky indeed you don't ride on a camel. To ride on a camel, you sit on a whammel. A whammel, you know, is a sort of a saddle held on by a button that's known as a faddle. And boy, if your old whammel faddle gets loose, I'm telling you, ducky, you're gone like a goose. And poor Mr. Potter, tea-crosser, I-dotter, 
he has to cross T's and he has to dot I's in an I and T factory out in Van Nuys. Oh, the jobs people work at. Out west, near Hotch Hotch, there's a Hotch Hotcher bee watcher. His job is to watch, is to keep both his eyes on the lazy town bee. A bee that is watched will work harder, you see. Well, he watched and he watched, but in spite of his watch, that bee didn't work any harder, not much. So then somebody said, our old bee-watching man just isn't bee-watching as hard as he can. He ought to be watched by another Hotch Hotcher. The thing that we need is a bee-watcher watcher. Well, the bee-watcher watcher watched the bee-watcher. He didn't watch well. So another Hotch Hotcher had to come in as a Watch Watcher watcher. And today, all the Hotchers who live in Hotch Hotch are watching on Watch Watcher Watchering Watch. Watch watching the watcher who's watching that bee. You're not a Hotch Watcher, you're lucky, you see. And how fortunate you're not Professor de Debris, who has spent the past 32 years, if you please, trying to teach Irish ducks how to read Javanese. And think of the poor puffing Poogelhorn players who have to parade down the Poogelhorn stairs every morning to wake up the Prince of Pooh Boken. It's awful how often their Poogles get broken. And oh, just suppose you were poor Harry Haddo. Try as he will, he can't make any shadow. He thinks that perhaps something's wrong with his giz. And I think that, by golly, there probably is. And the Brothers Bazoo, the poor Brothers Bazoo. Suppose your hair grew like theirs happened to do. You think you're unlucky? <laughs> I'm telling you, Ducky, some people are muchly, oh, ever so muchly, muchly more, more, more unlucky than you. And suppose that you lived in that forest in France, where the average young person just hasn't a chance to escape from the perilous pants-eating plants. But your pants are safe, you're a fortunate guy, and you ought to be shouting, how lucky am I? And speaking of plants, you should be greatly gladdish you're not Farmer Falkenberg's 17th radish. And you're so, so lucky you're not Gucky Gown, who lives by himself 90 miles out of town in the ruins of Ronk. Ronk is rather run down. And you're so, so, so lucky you're not a left sock left behind, by mistake, in the caverns of Croc. Thank goodness for all of the things you are not. Thank goodness you're not something someone forgot and left all alone in some punkerish place like a rusty tin coat hanger hanging in space. That's why I say, ducky, don't grumble, don't stew. Some critters are much, much, oh, ever so much, much, so muchly, much, much more unlucky than you. Scrambled Egg Super by Dr. Seuss. I don't like to brag, and I don't like to boast, said Peter T. Hooper. But speaking of toast, and speaking of kitchens, and ketchup, and cake, and kettles and stoves, and the stuff people bake, well, I don't like to brag, but I'm telling you, Liz, that speaking of cooks, I'm the best that there is. Why, only last Tuesday, when Mother was out, I really cooked something worth talking about. You see, I was sitting here, resting my legs, and I happened to pick up a couple of eggs. And I sort of got thinking, 
It's sort of a shame that scrambled eggs always taste always the same. And that's because ever since goodness knows when, they've always been made from the eggs of a hen. Just a plain common hen. What a dumb thing to use with all of the other fine eggs you could choose. And so I decided that, just for a change, I'd scramble a new kind of egg on the range. Some fine, fancy eggs that no other cook cooks, like the eggs of the ruffle-necked Salamagooks. A Salamagookses. Say, they should be good. So I went out and found some, as quick as I could. And while I was lugging them back to the house, I happened to notice a tizzle-topped grouse in a tree down the street, and I knew from her looks that her egg and the egg of the Salamagooks ought to mix mighty well, ought to taste simply super when scrambled together by Peter T. Hooper. So I took those eggs home and I frizzled them up and I added some sugar, two-thirds of a cup, and a small pinch of pepper and also a pound of horseradish sauce that was sitting around, and also some nuts. Then I tasted the stuff, and it tasted quite fine, but not quite fine enough. To make the best scramble that's ever been made, a cook has to hook the best eggs ever laid. So I drove to the country, quite rather far out, and I studied the birds that were flitting about. I looked with great care at a mop-noodled finch. I looked at a beagle-beaked, bald-headed grinch. And also, I looked at a shade-roosting quail, who was roosting right under a lassalax tail. And I looked at a spritz and a flannel wing jay. But I just didn't stop. I kept right on my way. Because they didn't have eggs. They weren't laying that day. Then suddenly, boy, up that hill a short space, birds, they were laying all over the place. Great happy gay families with uncles and cousins, all laying fine, strictly fresh eggs by the dozens. Why, I'd have a scramble more super than super. Scrambled eggs super de duper de booper. Special deluxe a la Peter T. Hooper. I picked out the eggs in a most careful way. I only picked those that I knew were grade A. I only took eggs from the very best fowls. So I didn't take eggs from the twiddler owls. Cause I knew that the eggs of those fellows who twiddle taste sort of like dust from inside a bass fiddle. I went for the kind that were mellow and sweet. And the world's sweetest eggs are the eggs of the queet, which is due to those very sweet trout which they eat. And those trout, well, they're sweet, because they only eat wogs. And wogs, after all, are the world's sweetest frogs. And the reason they're sweet is, whenever they lunch, it's always the world's sweetest bees that they munch. And the reason no bees can be sweeter than these, they only eat blossoms off bezel nut trees. And these bezel nut blossoms are sweeter than sweet. And that's why I nabbed several eggs from the queet. But I passed up the eggs of a bird called a strudel, who's sort of a stork, but with fur like a poodle. For they say that the eggs of this kind of a stork are gooey like glue, and they stick to your fork. And the yolks of these eggs, I am told, taste like fleece, while the whites taste like very old bicycle grease. The places I hiked to, the roads that I rambled, to find the best eggs that have ever been scrambled. I hunted new birds along wild tangled trails, through gullies and gulches, down dingles and dales. I wriggled my way and I crawled at a creek, through a forest of ferns that was 40 miles deep. 
and I mushed through the brush till I found a fine quigger, whose eggs are as big as a pinhead, no bigger. Then I went for the eggs of a long legger quang. Now this quang, well, she's built just a little bit wrong. For her legs are so terribly, terribly long that she has to lay eggs 20 feet in the air. And they drop with a plop to the ground from up there. So unless you can catch them before the eggs crash, you haven't got eggs. You've got long legger hash. Eggs. I'd collected 302. But I needed still more. And I suddenly knew that the job was too big for one fellow to do. So I telegraphed north to some friends near Fazol, which is 10 miles or so, just beyond the North Pole. And they all of them jumped in their catamaside, which is sort of a boat made of sea leopard's hide, which they sailed out to sea to go looking for grice, which is sort of a bird which lays eggs on the ice, which they grabbed with a tool which is known as a squitch, because those eggs are too cold to be touched without which. And while they were sending those eggs, I got word of a bird that does something that's almost unheard of. It's hard to believe, but this bird called the Pelf lays eggs that are three times as big as herself. How that Pelf ever learned such a difficult trick, I never found out, but I found that egg quick. And I managed to get it down out of the nest and home to the kitchen, along with the rest. But I didn't stop then, cause I knew of some ducks, by the name of the single file Zumzian Zucks, who stroll single file through the mountains of Zums. Quite oddly enough, with their eggs on their thumbs. And some fellows in Zums, whom I happen to know, just happened to capture a thousand or so. And they wrapped up their eggs and they mailed them by air. Marked special delivery, handle with care. I needed more helpers, and so for assistance, I called up a fellow named Ali, long distance. And Ali, as soon as he hung up the phone, picked up a small basket and started alone to climb the steep crags and the jags of Mount Struku to fetch me the egg of a Mount Struku cuckoo. Now these Mount Struku cuckoos are rather small gals, but these Mount Struku cuckoos have lots of big pals. They dive from the skies with wild cackling shrieks, and they jabbed at his legs and they stabbed at his cheeks with their yammering, clamoring, hammering beaks. But Ollie, brave Ollie, he fought his way through. And he sent me that egg as I knew he would do. For my scrambled eggs super de duper de booper, special deluxe, a la Peter T. Hooper. In the meanwhile, of course, I was keeping real busy collecting the eggs of the three eyelash tizzy. They're quite hard to reach, so I wrote on the top of a hammocka, schnimmica, schnamica, schnop. Then I found a great flock of southwest-facing cranes, and I guess they've got something that's wrong with their brains. For this kind of a crane, when she's guarding her nest, will always stand facing precisely southwest. So to get at those eggs wasn't hard in the least. I came from behind, from precisely northeast. And I captured the egg of a grickly gractus, who lays them up high in a prickly cactus. Then I went for some ziffs. They're exactly like zuffs, but the ziffs live on cliffs and the zuffs live on bluffs. And seeing how bluffs are exactly like cliffs, it's mighty hard telling the zuffs from the ziffs. 
But I know that the egg that I got from the bluffs, if it wasn't a Ziff's from the cliffs, was a Zuff's. Now I needed the egg of a moth-watching Sneth, who's a bird who's so big she scares people to death. And this awful big bird, well, the reason they name her the moth-watching Sneth is because that's how they tame her. She likes watching moths, sort of quiets her mind. And while she is watching, you sneak up behind and you yank out her egg. So I got one, of course, with the help of some friends and a very fast horse. If you want to get eggs you can't buy at a store, you have to do things never thought of before. Why, to get at the egg of one very small dog, we had to pry all of one mountaintop off. Then I heard of some birds who lay eggs, if you please, that taste like the air in the holes in Swiss cheese. And they live in big Zinzibar Zanzibar trees. So I ordered a tree full. The job was immense. But I needed those eggs and said, hang the expense. I still needed one more and I saved it for last. The egg of the frightful bombastic aghast. And that bird is so mean. And that bird is so fast that I had to escape on a Jillica Jast. A fleet-footed beast who can run like a deer, but looks sort of different. You steer him by ear. All through with the searching, all through with the looking, I had all I needed, and now for the cooking. I rushed to the kitchen, the place where I'd stacked them. I rolled up my sleeves, I unpacked them and cracked them, and shucked them and chucked them in 99 pans. Then I mixed in some beans, I used 55 cans. Then I mixed in some ginger, nine prunes and three figs, and parsley, quite sparsely, just 22 sprigs. Then I added six cinnamon sticks and a clove. And my scramble was ready to go on the stove. And you know how they tasted? They tasted just like, well, they tasted exactly, exactly just like, like scrambled eggs, super de duper de booper. Special deluxe, a la Peter T. Hooper. these delightful Dr. Seuss beginner book videos from Random House. First, it's The Cat in the Hat Comes Back. Do you know where I found him? You know where he was? He was eating a cake in the tub. Yes, he was. The hot water was on and the cold water too. 
And I said to the cat, what a bad thing to do. But I like to eat cake in a tub. Left the cat. You should try it sometime. Left the cat as he sat. The cat in the hat comes back. But that's not all. You'll meet lots more friends in There's a Wocket in My Pocket and Fox in Socks. Visit an out of the ordinary world in One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Say, look at his fingers. One, two, three. How many fingers do I see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven. Eleven? This is something new. I wish I had eleven, too. Funny things are everywhere in One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. And there are more surprises in Oh, the Thinks You Can Think and The Foot Book. Next, it's Dr. Seuss's ABC. Big D. Little D. What begins with D? David Donald Do. Dreamed a dozen donuts. And a duck dog, too. There's lots of fun from A to Z in Dr. Seuss's ABC. And I can read with my eyes shut. And Mr. Brown can moo, can you? Then it's time to rhyme with Hop on Pop. Hop. Hop. We like to hop. We like to hop on top of Pop. Stop. You must not hop on Pop. There are giggles galore in Hop on Pop. And more fun in store with Marvin K. Mooney, Will You Please Go Now? And Oh Say Can You Say? Sleepy heads everywhere will love I Am Not Going to Get Up Today. You can shoot at me with peas and beans. You can bring in the United States Marines. You can put the whole thing on TV. But I won't get up today. Not me. Get ready to enjoy I Am Not Going to Get Up Today. And three more Dr. Seuss favorites. The Shape of Me and Other Stuff. Great Day for Up. And In a People House. Dr. Seuss beginner book videos the whole family will love. Available only from Random House Home Video.